traveling back and forth from the past and the future, and sometimes you get confused. So are we in the present now? Is this the present? Yes, yes it is? All right, so we're in the right spot. Uh, I'm a futurist, and there are a few of these folks floating around, but I think you know probably everyone in this audience is a futurist. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, making and the idea of the maker. And I grew up in a, a small town in Kansas, actually. And in this rural community, everyone there is really resourceful. You know, they know how to make stuff, they know how to fix things. And my friend and I used to, to like to go camping a lot. And we'd hop on the tractor and we'd drive out into the woods. And this one time we're out there, we're camping, and it got really cold. And we looked at each other and said, wouldn't it be really cool if we had a hot tub right now? So we looked around at what we had. We had a tractor. There was a cow tank where the cows drank out of. And there was a moonshine still. And you may ask, why was there moonshine still? I don't know. It just coincidentally happened to be there. And so we said, we can do this. And about two hours later, we're both sitting in this really hot, redneck jacuzzi. And it was a beautiful thing, right? And I want to talk about these virtues and how there are these communities all around the world who know how to design and make stuff and how the opportunity for these communities is immense right now. And in the bigger context, there's something that's been happening since essentially World War II, that the rate of growth in trade has been bigger than the rate of growth in global GDP. And it's been about twice that for the last 50 years or so. And there's a lot of reasons why this has happened, but something has, has reset since the big recession. And that's essentially now that global GDP is about at the same pace as global trade. So then you ask, well, why is that happening? And one of the big reasons is that companies are now making more stuff that stays within their own borders, right? And there's this term that's often used in the US, reshoring. And really, I think it's a misnomer because reshoring implies that the jobs that we outsourced, largely to China over the last few decades, are coming back. And that the products that we made are coming back. And the reality is, is that new shoring, like, as we like to call it, is about new stuff. It's just that. The products that we're making are new, and the jobs that are being created are new. They're very collaborative. We're working with technology, so the entire skill set is new. Now, there's other people that believe this as well. Katie George from McKinsey and her team have done a lot of research showing that there's two primary drivers that influence where companies design and make stuff, and that's proximity to demand and being part of an innovation ecosystem. All right, now look for examples that are happening now. Foxconn, the maker of most of the stuff in your guys' pockets right now, right? These guys are building their next biggest factory in Indonesia. Why is that? Is it because the labor's cheaper? It is a little bit. Energy is actually more expensive there. They're doing it because their next biggest market is in Indonesia. And there's plenty of talent that they can recruit to work inside of these new high-tech factories. All right, IBM did a study last year showing that the cost of capital to start a new factory is going to be reduced by 90% in the next decade. 90%. Now, I think that's an optimistic figure, but even if it's half of that, that's absolutely massive. That means now manufacturing is being democratized. So I wanted to talk about a story and a project that, that I've been working on, and this is with one of our clients, Lightning Motorcycle. These guys are a small company of like 15 people. They're located in the Bay Area, south of San Francisco. And we're working with them to design a new swing arm. So this is the device that attaches the rear wheel to the motorcycle, so it's kind of an important piece. And we worked with them on this design, and so we modeled this thing in 3D and came up with ways to make it lighter and stronger and stiffer. And the way of manufacturing was actually kind of novel because we 3D printed this core, and then we matched it with machined aluminum components, and then we're wrapping this entire thing in carbon fiber to make it structural. And we're doing this all in our facilities in San Francisco, right? So we're actually making this thing right in the middle of the city. Now, in the process of setting up the system to manufacture this, I needed a little part. So I went to the hardware store, and a lot of you have probably seen this scene. There's this wall of like 20,000 parts. And they all look really similar, but they're all a little bit different. 
And the thing that I needed looked like this. And it cost like $2.50, it was a really cheap part. And actually the owner of the store was there, and I love it, this old mom and pop hardware store. And so the owner was helping me go through all these thousands of little things on the wall to try to find that thing. 45 minutes later, we never found it. So you think of all the time and effort that he and I spent trying to search for this, but also think of all the inventory that these guys have, just hoping that one day somebody's gonna walk in and need this coupler with a 12 inch, two, two, di two inch diameter thread. You know, it's very improbable, not to mention all the packaging and waste that's in this system. So what if I could have just called ahead or gone online and say, hey, can you print this? I'll pick it up in a couple of hours. So we think about the broader context of this idea of making things on demand and making them where you need it. Take a look at Barbie. Barbie is a $2 billion a year industry in and of herself. Barbie's a big woman. She has about 200 grams of plastic in her. And the packaging in total is probably like 500 grams of, of plastic. And most of that stuff obviously gets thrown away as soon as it's delivered. Now, with modern methods, we're really efficient at shipping stuff around the world. And you can fit about 13,000 Barbies in a single shipping container. Now, if you're to ship the raw plastic of the same Barbie, you can fit 250,000 products in the same shipment. It's a 20-fold increase in efficiency. Not to mention all the CO2 and emissions that you would save in shipping this stuff around the world. Right, it's absolutely massive impact. Now, I was reading the Economic Times yesterday, and it may or may not have been, actually it was two days ago, may or may not have been by the pool with a cocktail in my hand, but I found a really good article here locally. This was an interview with the CEO of Maersk, the world's largest shipping company. And the question was, is there overcapacity in the shipping sector? And his response was, yes, there is overcapacity. There has always been overcapacity. The shipping industry has always had the habit of having more ships than needed. Well, if that's the case, and you look at this new future, how much overcapacity are we gonna have in shipping at that time? So there's an expression we refer to as a leap in the making. And the best analogy of this is to think of telecommunications. Right, here in India, to reach all the villages, you're not running landlines all across the country. Right, you're building 3G, 4G networks, cellular towers, you're leapfrogging that infrastructure in order to connect everyone. Similar thing has happened in power generation. You know, we've seen in the US when you have one big factory that goes down and they're all connected on a central grid, everything goes down, right? The East Coast has had blackouts. So now we're going to distributed power generation systems with redundancy. So if one of them goes down, everything stays up. The same thing's happening in manufacturing. And think about it, if you're a developing country, the, this Maersk interview was happening because they're looking at building a new, new port here in India. Well, if you're gonna spend, let's say, $10 billion, it used to be that you'd spend that $10 billion on a big port and all the infrastructure to ship stuff in and out of that port, railway, highways, all that stuff. But what about a new idea where you can distribute that manufacturing? You can build redundancy. You can spread that capital over more smaller factories. What you're seeing here is actually a map of all of the 3D printers that are connected through 3D hubs. So these guys provide a service of networking 3D printers in any local area, for example, in Mumbai, there's over 100 printers in the area. And every factory, every individual who's plugged into this gets a ranking and a rating so you can see the quality that you can expect, the delivery times, the materials that they can produce. And so yes, 3D printing is slow, but if you have 100 of them or 1,000 of them in a short distance from you, suddenly that technology scales very quickly. Right? This is an interesting way to look at how we can embrace distributed manufacturing. Now there's some challenges here. The physical devices need to evolve. They need to increase in reliability, repeatability, and all this stuff. I'm not gonna get into the technical details of the downfalls of the hardware right now, but this is being fixed. But one other thing that I hadn't thought about that an entrepreneur enlightened me of recently, I was in the UK, and an Indian entrepreneur approached me after a presentation about 3D printing. And he said, you know, that's, that's great. The problem that we have in India is the import tariffs on these devices almost double the price of the printers. So he saw an opportunity, says I wanna manufacture these here locally, which is awesome. And so we wanna help with that, which is why we're building and open sourcing a printer and a platform to plug these printers into. 
so that people can, with a lower barrier of entry, become essentially manufacturers. Right? So this platform allows third-party hardware developers, software developers, material suppliers to all plug into and accelerate the adoption of printing across the globe. Now, this isn't just for consumer devices. This stuff is happening at a real industrial scale. Two months ago, a car was printed, a car chassis to be more precise. So a company called Local Motors and Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the US and Tennessee have partnered to actually print a car chassis. And they drove this thing away from a conference. Now, as a proof of concept, you can't go out and buy this thing today, probably not next year, but this is coming. And again, it's happening at an industrial scale. Now, to me, the most interesting aspect of this all is now consumers can get what they want and what they need, right? Another truism since essentially the industrial age has been that industrial economies have manufactured most of the advanced products for the rest of the world. The truth of the matter is, what does an engineer in Stuttgart know about air conditioning in Mumbai? Probably not a lot, right? This guy has a similar problem. He needs to get his stuff into the market and he's using a bicycle that was probably not made to carry stuff to market. That's exactly what these guys are doing, Buffalo Bicycle. They're designing and building bicycles for African farmers so they can get their products into market. So they're designed locally, puncture-proof tires, they can carry 100 kilos, they're easy to fix. All the tools are readily available in the communities to fix these things. And now the farmers can actually use them, and they're being assembled locally, so they're actually providing jobs at the same time. We're going to see a lot more of this happening. So if you look at this picture, most of us see devastation, destruction, debris. But a maker looks at this, and a maker sees raw material. I mean, this is like a dream, right? I remember. When I was a kid at my grandpa's farm, my 15 cousins and I would always go down to the barn where he had this big pile of trash. And we used to go down there and we used to make stuff. We'd make little cars and go-karts to push each other around in. Now, none of those things ever came to market. We never started a business with it. But we experimented and we learned how to put things together. So I realized that not everybody in the world and not everyone in the audience necessarily is a maker. But I think that we could all embrace some of the virtue in being able to design and create your own things, at least to empower you as a consumer. Thank you very much.